Balance is a word that often goes neglected in the church of our Lord. What do you mean by balance? I mean this. I mean the Lord is good. The God of the Bible, Jehovah, is a God of love. Is he a God of love only? Is he a God of love alone? No, he's not. Balance demands that we see both sides of Jehovah. Did you know that God can become furious? He has what is often referred to as righteous indignation. Big word. That may, may be what you and I sometimes call becoming angry. But unlike us, God is calculated. He's very precise. He doesn't have, for example, bad hair days where he wakes up on the wrong side of the bed and just trashes everybody. Where he just, nothing makes him happy. He, he, God is not that way. The God of the Bible is not that way. Sometimes we can get so caught up in thinking that God is love, we forget that God will punish sin. We're going through every book of the Bible and we've made it now to the Old Testament book of Nahum. Nahum, you may say. However you want to say it, it's fine with me. We'll be looking in the book of Nahum tonight. The Old Testament is one of those things that often we are unbalanced on. We don't try to study the Old Testament in the way that we should and we have a warped view of the Old Testament. We look at it as, well, it doesn't tell me what I need to do to be saved. It doesn't tell me how I need to worship God, so why would I read it? Well, we read it because it's the inspired Word of God. Because God had children in the Old Testament and God has children in the New Testament. We can see a lot of things that they did and not duplicate them. We can see some of the things that they did and duplicate them. Now, not necessarily in the specifics, but in the general aspect of they heard the word of the Lord, they did as they were told, and they did it with hearts filled with love. That's what we have to do. Tonight's sermon, we choose to entitle The Fury of Jehovah. There's going to be three D's in regard to this sermon tonight. In Nahum 1, 1 and 2, we're going to see the direction of Jehovah's fury. We'll see it is toward his adversaries. In the second place, we're going to see a demonstration of his fury. You know, Jehovah overrules everything. There's nothing made that was not made at the hands of Jehovah. He controls the wind, the sea, the air, everything. And we'll see through his awesome power, he demonstrates it to us. And then number three, we'll see a deflection of his fury. You know, the Lord is good, stronghold in the day of trouble. That's Bible. And he knoweth them that trust in him. Do you trust in Jehovah? Well, we'll find out. Now let's get started. Let's talk about the fury of Jehovah. We'll see the direction of his fury here in Nahum 1, 1 and 2. And let's see what the text says. Nahum 1 and verse 1, the burden of, what is the name of this place? Nineveh? The book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Isn't that the way you start off a book of the Bible right there? I reckon that's how you communicate what you need to say in a pretty concise manner. Now, let's think. Nineveh. What do we know about Nineveh? Just a few short weeks ago, we talked about some man. I believe his name was Jonah. Wasn't his name Jonah? And Jonah went to a place by the name of Nineveh. You remember that? You remember some of the things that we said in regard to Nineveh then? Nineveh, remember? Say here was Jonah. Jonah's supposed to go this way. Jonah went that away. He tried to any, anyway. 
Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. Do you remember who lived in Assyria? It, just think now. The Assyrians. Yeah, it was the Assyrians. The Assyrians lived in Assyria. Do you remember some of the things that we said about Assyria? It could very well be that these were the bloodiest, most vicious human beings who ever lived on the planet. And what happened with Jonah? When Jonah finally got his act together and did what he was supposed to do, he went up and preached what seems to be an eight-word sermon, but it was effective, wasn't it? And those wicked people turned from their wickedness. Well, guess what? They didn't stay turned from their wickedness. And there's a lesson there in and of itself. We can be right today and wrong tomorrow. But we can be wrong today and make it right today. When you look at the word burden here, you know what a burden is. It's something that weighs down, usually a heavy load of some sort. There is a heavy load, verbally, to start with, that is directed to Nineveh. Remember? The capital of Assyria, that's where the Assyrians lived. Possibly the bloodiest people on the planet. So yes, they repented in Jonah's day, but time progressed on. Probably about 150 years later, here's Nineveh now. Jonah was about 775 B.C., Nahum's in that 625 type range, somewhere in there. In that 150 years, they had gone from stopping the hand of Jehovah by their actions to now, you're not going to make it. We'll see the direction of the Lord's fury is to Nineveh. Do you remember some of the things that we talked about? Do you remember where we read in Amos chapter 4 and verse 2? Where Amos said, boy, Amos was brave. Remember, he stood up and called all the women of the northern kingdom basically the cows of Bashan. Remember? But he also told them something else right there, that you're going to get hooks put through your noses. You're going to get hooked through your nose and dragged off. Do you remember that about the Assyrians? Here these people are. They've been so bloody. They've been so vile. And yet Jonah, they repented in his day, but now... They didn't stay that way. Look in chapter 3 and verse 1 of Nahum. The Bible says, Woe to the bloody city. Who is this burden directed toward? This heavy weight is directed toward Nineveh. Don't think that these were kind people. Yes, they repented, but they didn't stay that way. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. Look in the same chapter. Last verse of the book, but verse 19. Understand this. Is God good? Yes. But God is also furious when we stay in sin and refuse to do what is right. Nahum 3.19, there is no healing out of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap hands over thee. Everybody says, good. The Assyrians are gone. Look. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? These were wicked people who turned from their wickedness and didn't stay turned. Did all that turning that they did, did it just automatically set them on the straight and narrow forever? Absolutely not. You can be righteous today and wrong tomorrow. You can be wrong today and before we finish this sermon, you can be right. When we look back on this, in verse number 2 where it says God is jealous, that shows the exclusive nature of Jehovah. He's not going to share you with everyone else. He's not going to share you with Baal. He's not going to share you with George Washington, Ben Franklin, or anybody else you may be able to fold up and put in your pocket. He's not going to share you with MasterCard and Visa and Discover or American Express. He is jealous. He wants all of you, not just a part. He's jealous, and when we look here at revenge and vengeance, that is God keeps records. He knows what goes on. He recognized when the Ninevites repented, but he also recognized that they didn't stay that way. When we look here at the word furious, it means the holiness and righteousness of God. Why was God furious? Did he have a bad hair day? Did he wake up on the wrong side of the proverbial bed? No. He's furious that they had their chances and they squandered them time and time again. And when you see wrath, 
He may as well equate wrath with justice. And really, it's God's goodness to the innocent. Is there any lesson? Is there a lesson or are there any lessons that we can see from that? The direction of Jehovah's fury? Well, I think so. The way we treat others reflects the view of our God. Did you know that? I want you to turn with me to the book of Psalms. Look with me in Psalm 115. We've talked some about the Assyrians and their bloody war gods. You know, a man becomes like the object he worships. If the, the greatest thing in your life is a warmonger and fornicator, what do you think you're going to be? A warmonger and fornicator. Look at the principle that's set, off, set out here in Psalm 115 and verse number 8. It's in the context of idolatry. I would recommend you read all this, but just look at verse 8. They that make them are like unto them. Do you remember the Assyrians' gods, Asher, Ishtar? Warmongers. Warmongers. Bloody. They invented them in their own minds. They that make them are like unto them. Now look. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Do you not see the way we treat others reflects the view of our God? How do we treat others? How does Jehovah treat others? He's merciful and long-suffering. Yes, there is such a thing as the fury of God. But it takes a whole lot of time and a whole lot of sin to get to that point. In Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, but the fruit of Singular of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. How do we need to treat each other? Do we need to bite and devour each other? If we do, we'll be consumed one of another and we'll stand in the fury of Jehovah. Number one, we talked about the direction of his fury. Now let's talk number two. Let's see a demonstration of his fury here. Look back in Nahum chapter 1. Let's read verses 3 through 6 here. Nahum 1 3. The Lord, that's Jehovah, is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Verse 4, he rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. Verse 5, the mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Verse 6, who can stand? Before his indignation. And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire. And the rocks are thrown down by him. Is that who you want to mess with? You want to go toe to toe with him? Well let's talk about some things. Verse 3 we see Jehovah's awesome power over the air. But you also observe the text say that Jehovah is slow to anger. It doesn't say he's impossible. It doesn't say for the Lord is impossible to anger. That wouldn't be righteous. That wouldn't be justice. But God is slow to anger. And understand this. When the wicked choose to remain in their wickedness, what does the text say? He will not at all quit the wicked. Some of us, I say us, as in human beings, I certainly don't hope members of the church but some human beings think that we can live and abide in wickedness and then somehow, some way, right before we die, we'll say, Lord, please forgive me my sins. And he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You loved me for all of 2.2 seconds of your life. It won't work. It won't work. It takes a lifetime. We have to dedicate ourselves to Jehovah and his ways. And understand all these verses are to teach the Assyrians, the Ninevites, about Jehovah. 
There's something that they needed to understand from this. But there's also something that we need to understand from this. In verse number 4, we see Jehovah's awesome power over the water. Doesn't the water have sense enough to obey Jehovah? Doesn't the water, can you see the water saying, can you imagine the Lord saying, okay, it's time for the waves to go. And they're saying, no, 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 no. I ain't one. Can't make me do it. Now, the waves have sense enough to obey, and the waters, don't they? Well, I think so. In verse 5, we see his awesome power over the entire world. Can you imagine the mountains not quaking? Can you imagine the mountains just saying, hey, uh, no, not today, friend. You ain't telling me what to do today. Forget about it. It won't happen. And then you get verse 6. You see Jehovah's awesome power over all the people. And you know every person on the whole face of the planet, when they hear he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, they say, yes, Lord. Wrong. Now why is it that the rocks and the dirt and the air and the water all have sense enough to obey, but a man won't? Now how can that be? How can all, everything else of Jehovah's creation say, yes, Lord, and then here's man. Well, ain't going to do it. Refuse to do it. Now, understand this. Did Jehovah create the waters? Yes. Did Jehovah create the world? Yes. Did Jehovah create all people? Yes. But there's something about man. We get to being awful hateful. We get awful spiteful. We get to awful big for our britches, don't we? Let's look in chapter 1 here in verse number 14. Now look at everything that was said. All the awesome power of Jehovah is shown. And then the, the really the logical question, who can stand in verse number 6 before his indignation? Can the Ninevites, these bloody people, you going to be able to stand before this? Look at Nahum 1 and verse 14. And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee, Nineveh, that no more of thy name be sown. Out of the house of thy gods will I cut off the graven image and the molten image. I will make thy grave. Now look at the four. Four gives you a reason. For thou art vile. The Lord's had enough of these people. They've had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And they still wouldn't do that which is right. I have some questions for you that you need to think about. Anyone in here? Can anyone in here whip a tornado? Anyone in here whip a hurricane? Anyone in here whip a tsunami? Anyone in here whip an earthquake? Go stop a volcano. Right when it's about to go, go up there and say, I command thee to cease and see what happens. Now why is it we can't whip any of those things? We can't handle tornadoes. We can't handle hurricanes. We can't handle earthquakes and floods and everything else. Why is it that we still rebel against Jehovah? Why is it that we still just could care less? When Old Testament prophet after Old Testament prophet after Old Testament prophet is pleading, saying, listen, you can't handle this. You cannot deal with him. You cannot deal with the fury of Jehovah. Why are you doing this? Why are you living in sin? Why won't you do that which is right? Is there a lesson there for us? I think so. Why do we continue to test the patience of Jehovah? Because the Bible says the Lord is slow to anger. We're going to find out where that line is. We're going to find out the, the teeter-totter and balance when he goes from, that's it. No more. That's every chance you've ever had or ever will have. Think of this. The way we act when no one is watching. Think of this. Reflects our view of our God. I want you to look at me in the book of Romans. <coughs> Romans chapter 2. How do you act when no one's watching? Reckon how the Assyrians, the Ninevites acted when no one, when they thought no one was watching. You reckon they opened up their Bibles and started praying? <laughs> what do you reckon they did? How do you reckon they acted when no one was watching? How do we act when no one's watching? You know, that's really where you can tell the character of a human being. What do you do when you think no one can see? Oh, wait a minute, someone can see. Romans 2 and verse 16. Picking up in the middle of a thought, but I think we'll understand it. In the day when God, that's the Father, 
by, through Jesus Christ, and we'll see that, when God shall judge the secrets of men. Do you have any secrets? Anything you need to get off your chest? You better make it right, friend. The day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to what? My gospel. You see the close relationship that Paul had with the gospel? So much so that he could say, my gospel. That's the Lord's gospel, but that shows how close Paul was to it. You going to whip a hurricane? You going to whip a tsunami? What will you do when you stand before Jesus Christ? the creator, the maker, the sustainer of all life, and you're found guilty. Friend, we don't know how bad hell is going to be. Number two, we've seen a demonstration of his fury. Number three, let's go back to the book of Nahum. Pretty simple sermon. We'll be out of here directly. Don't worry. Stay awake. You'll make it. We've talked about the direction of his fury. It's toward his adversaries. In second place, we've seen a demonstration of his fury. It's through his awesome power. And then number three, we'll see deflection or how to deflect his fury. And it's really by taking account of our actions. Let's look at Nahum 1 and verse 7. Now think of everything else we've read and then here's this gold nugget. It's almost like it doesn't fit, right? I mean, you're talking about everything else and then all of a sudden, Jehovah is good. Where's that coming from? Where's that coming from? The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. You know what that says? If you'll think back, if Nineveh would listen, they would learn. The same principles with us. We need to understand and be balanced in our view of God. God is good. His mercy is everlasting to those that trust in him. To those that will do what he says. But what about the other side of that? What about those who say, I don't care what you say. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care. I'm grown. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to go where I want to go. I'm going to say what I want to say. Well, then you're going to stand in the furious rage of Jehovah. Let's look here in this book in verse number 15. And understand this, the same message that condemned Nineveh consoled Judah. Judah can know, now you're one of your enemies, maybe your worst enemy at the time, they're gone. Now that's incentive for you to act right. That's incentive for you to get your life right. Nahum 1.15, Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, O Judah. See it? Keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows for the wicked, that's Nineveh, the Assyrians, shall no more pass through thee, he, the Ninevites, Assyria is utterly cut off. Let me say it one more time. The same message that condemned Nineveh consoled Judah. It's the same way with every sermon. You know what the difference is? The difference is whether we choose to take inventory of our lives. How do we match up with the word of God? How do we match up? Even by these Old Testament prophets. If an Old Testament prophet was to walk in here, what would he say? What would he say? Would he console us? Would he say, fret not, faint heart. Your enemies are about to be destroyed. Hold on and be faithful. Or would he say, what are you all doing? How can you act this way? Bite and devour one another. Fighting. Carrying on. Is that the way we act? God forbid. God forbid that God's children act that way. Are there any lessons we can learn from this? I think so. You know the way we act toward the gospel of Jesus Christ reflects the view of our God. You know, when you hear John 3.16... It ought to bother you. Is that right? I think sometimes we've just so memorized John 3.16 that it's just, it's nothing more than words. Is that all it is? It's just mere words for God so, so loved the world that he gave. 
His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What does that do? Man, the words on the table. Romans 5, 8, and 9. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What is that? Is it words? Do you even recognize what was said? Do you even know where those scriptures are? Friend, we have to understand when you realize you deserve justice. Justice says you sin once, you die and go to hell. That's justice. Mercy is extended. Even while we were sinners, even while we didn't care, God was merciful unto us. Was he not? Don't tell me there are things you've done that you should have died. All of us can say something has happened where you could have been crippled, dead, maimed, something. But it didn't happen. Now, if we, don't, if we don't get it right, do you want to take on the brunt of him that sends the tornadoes, that sends the hurricanes? You want to take on him that causes the earthquakes, that makes the volcanoes explode? How terrible. And how sad will it be. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fail severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Romans eleven twenty two. You remember 2 Peter 3, 9? The Lord is not slack, as some men count slackness. You understand that? He's not just wasting time. He's not just aloof and doesn't care. He'll keep his promise. He's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know what stuck out in my mind in going through the Old Testament? Repent. Get it right. You won't have. There, there will come. There's a line in that sand where the Lord says, I'm not taking it anymore. You have exhausted my patience. And punishment awaits. Let's don't get anywhere close to that line. What will we do? With the gospel. You need to hear it. You need to understand it. You need to believe it. John 8, 24. You need to repent of your sins. Acts 17, 30. Change your mind. Don't, don't face the fury of Jehovah. Get right. Confess the name of Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. And listen, friend, neighbor. You need to listen. You have to be must be immersed in water, totally immersed, covered by water. For what purpose? In order to be saved, in order to wash away your sins, to allow the blood of Christ to wash it away. Will you do that? If you don't, you'll face the fury of Jehovah. We can't stand it. I can't handle it. Neither can you. Those who are members of the church, and you sin. You need to repent. You need to pray. If you sin privately, you repent and pray privately. If you sin publicly, you repent and pray publicly. It's that simple. 1 John 1, 9. The lesson is yours. I'm begging you to choose wisely. What do you choose? Do so now as together we stand as we sing the song of encouragement.